There is a really, really annoying conversation amongst tailors that just drives some of us mad. And that's the conversation of, well, everybody's got their own way. You got to find your own way, different ways to achieve the same thing. And when you're just starting out, one of the biggest obsessions or perhaps insecurities that you may have is, am I doing it right? And if you want to answer that question, things like, everybody's got their own way just doesn't help what if your way is wrong is it still right because it's your way and if everybody's got their own way and that's the right way for them at least when is something actually right or wrong from an objective point of view so let me give you an example if you stretch a piece of cloth it becomes longer whether you like it or not it's the objective truth but if you stretch a piece of cloth to make it shorter is something that you may choose to convince yourself of, but eventually an exaggerated example of how ridiculous things can get. And you know who suffers the most from these confusions and conversations? People who are just starting out and don't have the best resources at hand, like books and students and videos and teachers. And I genuinely believe that if we want to progress our industry, we must eliminate as many confusions as possible because confusions, my friend, is poison. And not only for our new entrants do we need to do this, but also for our more experienced teams. Why do you think no tailor likes to pick up the work of another tailor? Or the fact that companies are still clinging to the way we used to do it cliche? And why can't tailors have a technical discussion that lasts longer than 10 minutes before one of them prematurely ejaculates the famous, everybody's got their own way. Come on, man. The question is, from what angle are we going to attack this problem? Because it is a problem and not a small one either. Okay, so one of the first things we have to do is to acknowledge that there are in fact different ways and that you do need to find that what works for you. But we also need to make a few things very, very clear. Tailoring is a combination of aesthetics and technique. And what makes things really difficult is that these two elements are mostly viewed as one. So you have this aesthetic element that deals with style, design, lines, colors, textures, and stuff like that. And you have this technical element that deals with things like formulas and construction and fabric manipulation techniques. And this aesthetic part is mostly subjective, whereas the technical part is mostly objective. And I say mostly because there are always going to be exceptions. It's really important to understand this, you know, um, because these two elements have no clear boundaries and they're constantly interfering with one another. So when you're looking at a garment, you're pretty much looking at both of these two elements at the same time. Although the design element is more likely to catch your eye first, but Here's the tricky part. A change in technique results in a change of aesthetics and vice versa. In other words, design dictates technique and technique dictates design. Now I'm pretty sure that at some point you've had some sort of an instruction that involved measures. Like this has to be two inches wider than this and this has to be an inch above this and an inch below that and you had to remember that all and if you didn't, well you froze like a rabbit in the headlights and that's obviously not something that you want. But you keep wondering why the hell those specific measures. And so you ask, and people will tell you most of the times, this is how I was taught, or this is just what I do, or some sort of a vague answer that you can't really connect to a specific concept. Only if you're really, really, really lucky are you gonna get some sort of an insight that's gonna help you to understand the bigger picture. But those insights are very rare. So here's a story for you. One morning I was working on a body canvas when I was still at Chittawar Morgan and there was a tailor called Vincenzo, great guy, who used to visit us every once in a while. And so he walked in that morning as I was working and I was closing the darts on a body canvas. And so he walked in and he looked at what I was doing and he told me that he uses lining strips cut on the bias for closing darts, whereas I was using lining strips that were cut on the straight grain. And so we talked and we talked and we talked, but this is what he said. He smiled and he said like, everybody thinks their way is the best way. And that got me thinking, 
It's weird, right? Because there are so many reasons to think the opposite, but somehow the majority of tailors are utterly convinced of their methods. I remember Alan Cannon, who, who's one of the merchant tailors of London, told me something really interesting. He said that a couple of years ago, they got a few tailors together for whatever reason. I think it was for like designing a new tailoring course for LCF. And they just couldn't get those tailors to agree with one another on how to make a pocket. It's bizarre, right? And I'm sure that you have at some point experienced something like this as well. I would say that what goes wrong in these conversations or let's say well situations is not that everybody is undermining each other's work or simply thinking that the other person's work is bad it's that everybody has a different spec sheet aka criteria in their mind which is invisible to everyone else and so your way is meeting your spec sheet which explains why so many tailors are under the illusion that their way is the best way their criteria is giving them the results that they have decided to want and even if you do have a set of techniques that gives you your results, there is still a chance that those techniques aren't actually the best way to give you what you're looking for. And so you have to review your criteria every once in a while. And I think this sheds light on something that's equally interesting, which is why are some tailors so much better than others? Well, I can tell you one thing. Apart from their knowledge and experience and understanding of the craft, which is a very important part, it's mainly their criteria, their spec sheet, that sets them apart. And this spec sheet thing is something that maybe they are taught or they have set for themselves, but... Look, I don't mean spec sheet in the literal sense of them having this mysterious manuscript that tells them about the secrets of Azkaban, but a set of techniques that's based on clearly articulated criteria, including the design. It's like, what do you find acceptable? How quickly are you satisfied? Do you know why you're not satisfied? Do you have a vision of how you want your work to look like? Do you know what techniques to use? And things like that. And I believe that this whole spec sheet thing is especially important when you're working in teams. Because without a common understanding of the underlying facts, you just find yourself in conversations that don't get you anywhere. It gets really, really dull. But as soon as you set a common criteria, you create room for discussion to find the best possible way to meet that criteria as a team rather than as an individual. I mean, unless you're working with some sort of a genius, and in that case, that genius should probably lead those discussions. But here's the thing. Individuals can easily create myths and strongly believe in them. And even worse, spread and protect them, man. Whereas in team discussions, you look at things more objectively, you, you scrutinize every idea, you, you kind of like, well, do a lot of myth busting and you improve on techniques and you fine tune them. Obviously, that is only if your team can cooperate properly and not just like explode as soon as one of them has a conflicting idea. So what am I trying to conclude here? Here's the deal. What's right or wrong should be viewed objectively and relatively. So what I mean by that is that right and wrong depends on two things. One of them is the objective truth which looks at the physics of materials and techniques and validates them through empirical measures. And the second thing is a desired result that's articulated through a specific set of criteria that relates to material cost, style, finesse, durability of garment and things like that. Now here are some examples of how right and wrong are defined objectively and relatively. If lightness of weight is the main criteria of a garment, it's technically wrong to use multiple layers of heavyweight interlining. But if light and lightness of weight isn't the main criteria, and let's say a rigid and a more structured garment is the desired result, it's technically right to use that same heavyweight interlining. Or here's another one. If you want the pocket area of a jacket to be flat, it's technically wrong to use a double dart. And with double dart, I mean the one that starts from zero, goes to something and ends up with zero. But if you want the pocket area of a garment or a jacket to be round, then it's technically right to use a double dart. Or let me give you another one. So 
if you're trying to prevent an area from stretching by using some sort of a tape, it's technically wrong to have that tape on the bias. But if you're trying to reinforce but not restrict, let's say, the seam of a stretchy fabric, then it's technically right to have a tape that's on the bias. And so keep in mind, whatever garment you're working on and whatever technique you're using, it's always according to a criteria. Even if that criteria is not consciously defined, it's the master of your choices. Make it clear and specific and think about it more because the success of your craft is heavily dependent on it.